。接下来，让我们欢迎林耀奇教授为我们带来他的演演演讲《陈嘉庚的职业教育观及其现代意义》。Good morning, everyone. I am Su Ping, the MC for today. Next, let us welcome Professor Lin Yao Qi for his segment, Dan Kaki's thoughts on vocational education. Prof Lin, please. Good morning. I understand that we have a very tight schedule. Okay, after listening to.、Uh, Professor Wang's story. I'm a baby in the whole system. <laughs> First of all, I have to start that I have been the, a judge of the Tangkaki Young Inventors Award for over 20 years. Okay, and、uh, as you know,、uh, it's a very important event.、Uh, every year, we have about 40 or 50 judges who spend their volunteer time on a Saturday to go through about. 500 to 1,000 entries, and finally we gave an award on、uh, a yearly basis. And to us, it's a very important learning call because it, it allows us to engage the younger generation. Okay, so this is what we have. Now I will start off not at 1920. <laughs> I will start off at 1968. Okay, Now, this one I'm going to do how the technical education in Singapore developed over time. And、uh, how does it uh, uh, link with Tangkaki legacy? Okay. Now let's start with technical education. Why 1968? I finished my A level and I wanted to go to a university and we don't have money. And I went out to tell the registrar I don't have money. I cannot attend the course. And the registrar said, "Young man, are you sure? I got 120 seats waiting for your place." Okay. At that time, the Singapore University is called University of Singapore. And you don't even have an engineering faculty. We're just starting, and there were three hundred places of engineering classes, and there are hundred and twenty people waiting for my seat. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I gave up the seat, and I went on to take up an apprenticeship with uh, uh, with the, those days. It's not even Singapore Airlines; it's called Malaysia Singapore Airlines. Okay, and I stayed in aerospace up to today, fifty-one years ago. So I can tell you the story about how Singapore's technical education evolved, and how it. it、uh, I, I hope within the twenty minutes. I'm watching the clock, by the way. Okay. <laughs> okay. At that time, as I mentioned to you,、uh, I took an apprenticeship, and that five years was the most valuable education I had. Although we were working in a very rugged condition, could be noisy, could be dirty, right? But I enjoy it a lot because there's so much thing to learn. First of all, you got to play with an aeroplane, you know. Can me and me when just come out of school,、okay? and then we we have to attend polytechnic in the evening just to enhance our education.、Okay? Now the polytechnic started in 1954, very very small poly in Prince Edward Road, and we have an engineering campus is going to be in Prince Edward Road, the same building. So you would imagine at that time the kind of facilities we have. And the, the kind that we went through, right? I don't want to glamorize it because we don't want you all to go through that. Okay.、Yeah. So from ni- 1978 was interesting because I had a scholarship from Singapore Airlines. I went to England to study, and when I came back, and then this campus was going to move to uh, uh, the present Dover Road, opened by Lee Kuan Yew. I was invited. I was very happy to be there to see such. You know, the Polytechnic campus was. Nicer than many universities in the world, you know, it's such a big, great step forward for us. Okay,、yeah. so we we move on, and then we have this thing called the Balestier Trade School, 1940. Okay, we have been there for a long time. Finally, we move on until we become VITB, and today we have this thing called ITE, and I live next to ITE College East. I saw the building came out right in 2005. It was amazing, you know, the college itself. Those who have not seen an IT college, go and visit one of them, right? You will be very proud of the way Singapore develops education.、Okay. So these are the things which I have been fortunate to go through. Okay.、Yeah. Next, come to NTI. We wanted to start a practical oriented、uh, university. Okay, and we. 
we tried our best to do so many things and then uh, NTI came along and later uh, it became NTU. Okay. Now just imagine today NTU has got 10,600 over engineering students compared to 300 in 1968. It was a tremendous move. And to me, it was a great honor that they invited me to teach uh, as an adjunct professor in NTU up to today. Okay. okay, I want to quickly move to this very obscure thing called the Sambawa Road Rubber Manufactory, 1924. Okay. Why is this so important? That was because then Tankaki was faced driven by low rubber price. Most entrepreneurs will panic and will do maybe to close down or move on to another way. Tankaki did not falter. Right? So when he saw the, the rubber price was coming down, he decided that to move, to invest more into a factory to get more value added. And more importantly, he was thinking of employment. So this is a very forward thinking that our government, EDB, were doing many, many years later. At that time, he already had this thing. Okay? And later, he mentioned that beyond employment, he was thinking that this factory could be the seat for training technicians because he believed that training technical technicians is a way to get out of poverty. That means he knew about the Industrial Revolution, the power as a Professor Wang said, the power of industrial capitalism. Right? And he wanted to move on using his capital and all he was thinking of training. Okay? Right. And interestingly, he, he adopted, he adopted uh, Henry Ford. He's known as Henry Ford of Malaya. He adopted Henry Ford method of vertical integration. What do you mean by vertical integration of an industry? He wants to make everything himself. He says, everything that we can do ourselves, we'll do it, unless we can buy it cheaper somewhere else. So he started rubber plantation, okay? and he went to rubber processing, and now he went into manufacturing. So everything is on their own, and actually he did even more than that. Finally, he started to print labels. He started printing to print labels for his products, right? and he started to make cut boxes and everything himself. And he suddenly thought that, why don't I print a newspaper? And he started Nanyang Sampao. Okay? Nanyang Sampao was meant to be a commercial newspaper and to advertise Tankaki's product. Okay? Very, very interesting a vertical and horizontal integration of an industry. Very, very far ahead of the rest of the people. Okay? So all, all the components from rubber plantation, and I want to mention something about the rubber plantation. Okay. Even the rubber plantation, there was so much innovation in the system. Okay. Now what the Chinese led by, by Tang Kaki, Tang Kaki owned the most rubber plantation at that time, and with a few others. Right. The way they organized the, the, the rubber plantation was really ingenious. Okay. You know, it takes about seven years for a rubber tree to grow. So if you buy a piece of land and you start to grow, you wait seven years to get your money. What they did was, they actually have this thing called the catch crop. So Tangkaki, his group, his rubber plantation is managed by a subcontractor. They give them a place to live and a plot of land to plant pineapples. Pineapples are very fast, six months you can get cash. So during these seven years, these people were using the pineapple to support these seven years. So it doesn't cost him anything. It self-maintained itself. And every seven years, you have a matured rubber plantation. And it's zero cost to Tankaki. Okay. Fantastic innovation. It was so good that the British, the British were amazed that they could do 130, what I call, $150 per acre, the cost of running an estate. Compared to the British, they were doing $600 per acre, cost of a plantation. So the British were amazed, but interestingly, Tangkaki and the, a group of Chinese uh, uh, planters actually sell a matured plantation back to the British, uh, uh, the British uh, or the Europeans are planters. Okay, that way they increase their capital, and from the capital they reinvest in all kinds of things. Okay, 
So to me, uh, Tangkaki was, I mean, in, I looked through the early years and I, a lot of things they were doing actually were what we are doing in much later years. So he, besides that, Tangkaki was has this thing of he's able to get right people, good people to run for him. Okay, and he got a chemist. Now in those days, a lot of operational businessmen do not think beyond education. They were just thinking of making more profit. But Tangkaki saw that, as I mentioned, technology was important. He was able to garner talent people to work for him. So he has got people like. Uh, let me see, there are a few names which I thought was uh, very interesting, right? This chemist, right? And that makes the whole of difference to Tankaki's uh, uh, factory, okay? And they actually have got five, uh, you can see here, they've got five uh, 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 patents from 1924 to 1932. It looks like things like inventing and improving rubber soles and inner tubes of pneumatic tires. Now, we were using those things when I was a child, a kid over there. But we didn't realize that this actually comes from our own factory. Okay. He used ma new method of bonding rubber shoes and heels to the boots. Okay. Simple thing, but it was actually invented in Singapore. Okay. Then he went into making so wooden sandals. Wooden sandals are very popular in those days. Okay. And they're making manufacturing attaché cape, all these things, and, and, and rubber boots. Uh, and we were using those things, not realizing that it was actually invented and created in Singapore. Okay. And of course, he created things collapsible, airtight, watertight, waterproof product, right? and to, to do all kinds of services he did. Okay. So that was the great thing about the Sambawa rubber road manufacturing. For those who are familiar with Singapore, uh, uh, Sambawang Road is not in Sambawang, it's not in the north. It's actually in, near Kalang River. Okay? And the factory was used to be a go down, a huge factory over there. Okay? So that was the, the, the time where, where I would say that it's the beginning of the whole industrial uh, philosophy of Singapore. Okay? Okay. This is what we can see. Okay? You notice that the Tankaki Foundation, not, not Foundation, Tankaki Company actually employed uh, 4,000 over employees in 1929, okay? And by 1933, right, the number of employees rose to 6,000 over. That is, that is a big company, right? Today, there are not many companies in Singapore who has more than 5,000 workers, okay? Today, 6,000 over workers. And he believed that he, this is enabling to train the people for the future, okay? okay. And these are the kind of goods that you can see uh, they made, okay? Okay, now let's look at legacy. First of all, we call him the Henry Ford of Malaya. As mentioned, Henry Ford is the entrepreneur, uh, uh, what I call uh, technology, technology uh, and, and enterprise, everything. Okay. And he was also very good at, a lot of people didn't realize that Henry Ford got a lot of problems with the union in America. But he was the first person who actually offered pay increases for their staff without being asked. Henry Ford was the first person who doubled the pay of the workers. Okay? Now, he, was, he looked after the people and his belief in talent. Okay? Sporting talent, as I mentioned, right? then hard work. Henry Ford, really hard work. And Mr. Tankaki did the same thing. Okay? He has no holidays. Right? He slept four or five hours a, a night and then he has no Sundays. Okay? And it's, it's an example to the staff what hard work meant. And he said hard work to avoid speculative wealth uh, making. Right? Instead of trying to maximize profit, he actually looked into the infrastructure. And of course, his most important, uh, which Peggy used to remind me, like sincerity and perseverance were his icon. Okay? Now, he focused on building a better society right? instead of just going for the business. Okay? And what, what was important was his focus on nation building. And his nation building was meant, was went through education, that is his philosophy. Now, there was another person uh, you can, uh, what I'm saying is that if a business has to run with a higher desire, something much beyond the profit, that is where Tankaki stands for. And uh, interestingly, there's this guy called Elon Musk. Okay? It's the same philosophy. Elon Musk started his business not to make money. 
is to save humanity. He wants to fly to, he sees that this world is gone. Huh? So he wants to make sure that by that time we are already gone, we can go to Mars and colonize and save humanity. That was his drive. Okay? And he was brilliant at the, the kind of things he was doing. He, Elon Musk also did vertical integration. He starts from fundamental. Right? Now, so I can see Tankaki has roughly the same kind of, of mission right, to drive us so far. Now let's look at the, what is a VUCA world. Many of you probably have heard VUCA means volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Okay, this is a term that has been used by marketing guru for the last 10 years. And I, I thought it was very fitting for the world we're living today. Okay. Now in the VUCA world, what do we need? We need innovation. Right? We need flexibility and resilience. Okay. You know, in one of, one of the words they use, they, your company needs to be cyborg, you know. Now, those are science fiction people know what I'm talking about, okay. Right? You need to be a cyborg. That means you have to adapt very quickly and move on, okay. Right? And resilience is important because you can never tell what's going to disrupt a business. Today, we have internet, we have, we have uh, what you call fintech, right? online shopping. Everything are disrupting business all. If you don't have resilience and you are not flexible and you don't have innovation, you are finished. Okay. This is the VUCA world we are in here. Okay. So let's look at what Henry Ford, uh, what I say, visionary vertical integration. Okay. These are very early of Tankaki's uh, vision to do things. Okay. Right. Sporting talent, he has got great people. He got Lee Kuan Chan to take care of finance. He has got a few other people right, to take care of his, what I call, uh, his technology, okay, and then you have, uh, uh, I guess another guy who will take care of his uh, shipping, you know, all, all this knowledge. He, he get these great people to work with him, okay. So that is, that is absolutely important talent. You look at Google, you look at all these people, all they do is getting the best talent in the world, okay, to support them. Okay. Hard work, right, avoid speculative wealth making. This is essential, right. Today, a lot of people are trying to that they see making wealth without working was the, was the real uh, uh, mission of a human being, okay? Right. And I think that is, that is dangerous, okay? Of course, a lot of people make it, okay? But, but to Kang Tankaki, no. You, hard work, okay? Do not speculate, okay? And sincerity and perseverance is actually on the individual, okay? But taking on the bigger context, right, we call it integrity and resilience. It's the same thing in a different context. We take it a bigger global, it is called integrity and resilience. More so for engineering work. You can see for yourself big companies like get into trouble because they lost track of their integrity. I'm afraid to say I have to mention one very important big company like, like Boeing. Okay? Like Boeing was an icon. Okay? We all, I'm an aerospace, I tell you. But today Boeing has suffered a very bad because of the act. The recent air crash, okay. There was some problem with the integrity of some of the management there, okay. Focus on building a better society, right? That is important. As I say, uh, Elon Musk focused on getting, saving the humanity, which is why he's very successful. When he get into trouble, people will help him because he wasn't going after the profit. He was going after something higher. Okay? Now, Tankaki started with all the time trying to as what the Prof. Wang said, putting all his capital in a bit too much into, into education, okay? And this is why he got into a little bit of financial problem, okay? okay? And finally, right, education to escape from poverty. That was important. Not just wealth making. Making wealth is fine, but it's escaping from poverty. And he was actually a pioneer of social enterprise. All the time he was thinking of this big empire, he was actually thinking of educating the people to get away from poverty. Okay, I think uh, that ends my... Now, before that, you notice that the British were watching him and the British thought this guy was great. And look at the kind of comment some of the British governor right in 1908 said, right? He will because of his industry and thrift. Okay? There was another guy say, ah, maybe it's good luck. Okay? Right? And the other guy, right, Sir Hughes Clifford said, it's energy, initiative, and daring. Okay. 
Now, this is the, the quality which even the British colonial master recognized uh, Tan Kah Kee's uh, what I call values to the society. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I did it in 20 minutes, okay? And if you haven't seen this, okay, this is the background to what he is about. Thank you.